Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. We are still in section 14 and talking about the Gaussian mixture model. However, today we will focus on the expectation maximization algorithm. And with focusing, I mean, we are trying to understand what does the E step really do and what does the M step really do from a more abstract point of view. And finally, at the end, I will also show you that the EM algorithm is a special case of something even more general. Okay, which personally I find it very interesting because typically you get confronted with k-means and then you say, okay, yeah, nice algorithm, but where does it come from? And it can be derived from something principled from optimization, which is quite nice. And it can be also said something, what it is really doing, the E-step and the M-step. Um, partially, I think you are working on it already by showing that the distortion measure is kind of minimized by the E and M step, that's already something very useful, right? Since the distortion measure is basically E to the minus, the distortion measure is a Gaussian distribution. So you are kind of maximizing a Gaussian distribution when you minimize the distortion measure. So that's already something useful. However, we can say more about it and also um, get a more general view on it. Having a more general view allows us as well to use these ideas from the EM method and maybe in other problems as well that will come up in your career at some point. So that's the other thing. Okay, but before we go on with EM, there were some interesting questions in the rocket shed. So there was question one, what about this thing X transpose outside or inside? So what is this difference between these two matrices? So how are they the same? And so I want to discuss that a little bit because it's like an interesting topic. So which is typically beyond the stuff that you can read. And then there was the question, does PCA really have assumptions. So there was also a question. I gave already a kind of lengthy answer to that one, but let me repeat it because I think it's quite interesting. Yeah, the question was very good. And I'm sometimes sloppily saying things. And so the thing with the assumption was also like a bit hand wavy. So let me ma make this more precise. But let's first, I, let's, what can we say about this thing about this covariance versus the gram matrix? How are they related? Because it looks like when I have a data matrix, I could have the data points as columns, okay? And then this is the covariance, this is the gram matrix. And of course, if the data matrix has the data points as rows, then of course they switch their, the rows, okay? So what does it mean? In a way, if I have a data matrix like that, let's for concreteness say we have a two by 10 matrix. So we have 10, 10 points. Then one way to plot it would be now to have like 10 points, okay? So those are my, my 10 column vectors, okay? And I can plot them like this, okay? Alternatively, if I view my data matrix now the other way around, I could say I have two vectors that are 10 dimensional, okay? So here I'm in 2D and let's use this nice notation from the paper from um, Sam Rovais, yeah, where he kind of used this for high dimensional space. So let's say now we are in 10D, okay? So here we are in 2D, and here we are in 10D, and there basically we also have two vectors, okay? So each row in this data matrix could be understood like two vectors. So here we have, so let's write this out, 10 column vectors, and here we have two row vectors. And they are very related, right? So talking about the covariance matrix here corresponds to talking about the gram matrix yeah, in this data set. Or talking about the covariance matrix in this data set corresponds to the gram matrix in that data set, okay? So it looks like this is one data set and this is like a dual data set in some other world. However, notice like these data points here, they really span the full space, so they really fill it up since there are only two dimensions, if I have 10 data points, like in general position, they will span the whole space. Whereas here I'm having two data, uh, two vectors, they're very lonely in 10 dimensions. So they're only spanning a very low dimensional space. So in particular, that means um, if that is my shape, it basically means that my X is looking like this, okay? And that implies that the, um, the covariance matrix will be a two by two matrix, yeah? Possibly of rank two, if they are in general position. 
However, the gram matrix, which is like the gram matrix will be this thing where I'm having like these long Shoko bars, okay? And when you hear Shoko bars, it typically means low rank, okay? So this is also, this is a 10 by 10 matrix, but it, the rank of it is two. And that corresponds to the fact that here are only two vectors, very lonely in 10 dimensions and not spanning the full space, okay? So th those things are somehow related. What else can we learn from this? Okay, as I said, the gram matrix down here is calculating the inner products between the vectors, okay? So the inner products of these 10 dimensional vectors, curiously, they correspond to the entries in the covariance matrix. Okay, so how many possibilities do I have here? So let's make this a bit more explicit. So let's say we call, um, we say we have a matrix X and we have X1 to X10. Or alternatively, let's view it as Z1 and Z2, where we now use this transposed version, okay? And then we could say, this thing here is x1 and so on, and this thing is z1 and z2. Okay, now the entries of the covariance matrix of this data set that is kind of describing the, the ellipse over here, yeah, it has the entries z1 transpose z1, um, z1 transpose z2, z2 transpose z1. Okay, all these inner products Right, the gram matrix in this data set here corresponds to the covariance matrix over here. In particular, that means that to calculate the variance, for example, along the x-axis, yeah, that corresponds to calculating the norm of this vector with its like z1 transpose z1, which is the norm of the the L2 norm of this vector. Okay. More interestingly, correlation between this axis and this axis corresponds to the angle between those two, okay? Since the inner product here, yeah, this is exactly the covariance between the first coordinate and the second coordinate. However, interpreted in this view, yeah, it is quite interesting that it's kind of measuring the angle between two vectors. So calculating the correlation or something between two, two, two um, random variables is like measuring kind of vectors between, um, the angles between vectors, okay? which I find quite curious. Um, however, here's an assumption to all of this. So we assume that the mean along the row, so which we wrote like multiplying a one from the right hand side is equal to zero, okay? So basically this must be the origin here, okay? However, does it mean that this thing is also has mean zero? No, it doesn't, okay? So here the mean is different. Actually, as we know, if I would move the origin to the mean of those two vectors, then the origin would be right here, okay? And then, as you could imagine, and now all entries in this matrix will change, right? So if I move the origin round, yeah, by changing the mean of a data set, I'm changing all the inner products, okay? Which makes sense in a way, right? Because we cannot use this formula if the mean is not over here, yeah? Then we are not really calculating with these inner products the covariance, the covariances of two variables. It only holds if I say in this world the mean is zero, okay? So the mean of the xi of the, this matrix x is equal to zero, yeah? And then this kind of discussion um, can be seen. Okay, so. Now, what do I want to say, by the way? First of all, this is kind of fun to think about that the correlation between two variables is the same as the angle in the dual data set, okay? So that's kind of interesting. And the other thing is the duality is really here that the gram matrix over here is the covariance matrix and the covariance matrix over here is the gram matrix. So they are really interchangeable. So I, I hope this kind of sufficiently gives you some insight, or at least it gives you some starting points how to think about that, okay? Any more questions about this thing up here? If not, let me erase it. And let's briefly talk about this thing with the two assumptions. So let's talk about this question. What did I mean with this assumption? 
And let me just repeat the example that I gave in Rocket Chat. Suppose we have two data sets, okay? So here's one data set given by a big data matrix X, and here's another data set, okay? And let's apply PCA to it. And let's say PCA applied to X gives me the same answer as PCA applied to Z, okay? So let's say, what does it mean? It means something like, okay, let's say the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the corresponding covariance matrices are identical, okay? So now, question, um, does it now imply that X, or uh, let's say the, the distribution of X is equal to the distribution of that, so does it really apply, imply this? Unfortunately not, right? So we kind of calculate certain features of the data set here, and we calculate certain features of the other data set. However, if the features are the same, it doesn't mean that the distributions are the same. So to see this, let's make this more concrete. So let's say this is really from, a, from some Gaussian distribution where we have like an ellipsoidal shape. However, the Z is from, like a banana type data set, okay? Where I'm having the mean inside some void region where there's no data, okay? And then if I would draw the covariance matrix, I'm getting exactly the same shape as up here, okay? So basically those two data sets are designed, let's say, in such a way that their mean is exactly the same and that their covariance structures are also exactly the same. And if that's the case, it means that the PCA will output the same solution, right? However, the distributions are very, very different. So, not in general. However, but, yes, for Gaussians. Okay, so if both, if I would assume that both distributions are Gaussian distribution, okay, then it means that if the PCA things are the same, then there must be the same distributions. And of course, this is again a bit hand wavy, right? I'm ignoring the means, right? So somehow the PCA is not looking at the means. But so let's assume they have the same means, okay? And then they will also have the same Gaussian. So what I mean by a statement like PCA assumes that the distributions are Gaussian, I'm kind of meaning PCA is only looking at properties that can be expressed or that are de describing a Gaussian distribution. So PCA is not looking at higher order moments or something. So it's not looking whether it's actually a banana or something like this. So it's only looking like at the spread in, in both directions and trying to find the right rotation, okay? So another picture that I like is being having glasses. So now I can see everything very clear. I see the banana and once I'm setting my glasses, my PCA glasses, then suddenly everything looks like a Gaussian around me, okay? So the original data was a banana, but with my Gaussian glasses, my PCA method, I'm kind of looking at everything like it would be a Gaussian distribution, right? Because I'm ignoring all the rest, okay? So does it mean now I cannot apply PCA to banana data sets? No, of course, you can apply it anywhere, right? However, you won't learn anything about the data set that is beyond the information that a Gaussian would express. So with other words, the PCA is giving you a fit to the data by fitting a Gaussian distribution to your data. And then you get the properties of this Gaussian distribution. And that's it, okay? Good. I'm seeing that the, the person who asked the question is nodding all the time, that's perfect. So that's what I wanted to achieve. Nice, okay. Uh, but these are, these are really important questions because sometimes these kind of hand wavy intuitions, right? When you then start thinking about it, that's what you should do, of course, then they are not so obvious anymore. Maybe one needs to be a bit more precise what, what one really wants to say. Okay, great. Let's get back to the expectation maximization. And did I remember the page? No, maybe not, but the computer did. So where do I have to go? Ah, it also didn't do it. Okay, let's guess. Intuitively, I would say 23. Yes, I hit it. So this is the page where we stopped last time, okay? And basically what we were talking about, we were starting with the super intuitive k-means and with a nice motivation and we looked at an animation 
And I must apologize already now, today we won't have a Jupyter notebook, okay? Today it will be more theoretical, yeah? But I hope you, you gain something and you learn something from it. So the derivation of k-means is totally fine, right? I mean, it's intuitive, we prove some convergence and why not, then run it. And we can also generalize it now to, to more complicated Gaussians where we also want to estimate the covariance matrix and also these pi here, these proportions for the different components, so why not? However, we kind of heuristically kind of set the derivatives to zero and then fixed some of the entries here. So the cheating was that the tau, tau also contains all these parameters in here. So to calculate the taus, we need the parameter theta. So this is not really solving the equation for mu i because the tau i also contains the mu i, okay? So let me briefly repeat this. So we considered the following model, mixtures of Gaussians, okay? So the mixture of Gaussian is a, probability distribution for some point cloud that we call now the random variable, let's call it X. And it's written as a summation of um, lots of Gaussians, okay? So by this, we can have like a, a multimodal distribution. Multimodal means it has several bumps, okay? So it's like a hilly, a hilly region we can model by this, okay? And we have lots of parameters, so why not trying to estimate these parameters, okay, from a data set? And unfortunately, that's not so easy. Right, so we, what we did, we wrote down the log likelihood of it and typically by putting a logarithm in front of it, we can resolve the, um, we, can, we can resolve all the stuff that gets multiplied in the probabilities, right? When you know the basic formulas for, multi, for, for probabilities like base rule is all about products, like multiplying stuff. And then putting a logarithm in front of it is clever because it turns it into summations. However, we were kind of lazy when we were modeling it. So we were writing it as a summation itself already. And then the logarithm doesn't work nicely with the summation of lots of densities. However, why didn't we put a product here? Because putting a product makes it super difficult to normalize the resulting thing, right? So to normalize the summation of several densities, we just need to make sure that the weights in front of it, that they sum up to one. So that's very convenient for us to get a normalized density. That's why we use the summation sign. So that's very nice. However, if we want to do inference with it, it suddenly couples everyone with everyone else. So when we calculate the derivatives, um, we get these expressions here where I didn't plug in the tau i. However, you identify here this big term here, it's always exactly the same. And those were the ones that last time and today we will call responsibilities. But I kind of said, oh, I recognize it. Let's call it tau i. And then putting under the carpet that the tau i also depends on pi, also depends on mu, also depends on sigma. And then now setting these things to zero, but assuming that these expressions are constant, we get these nice update formulas, right? But it's a little bit cheating. The resulting algorithm is fine. As we will see, it's an instant of a more general EM procedure. However, the derivation is a bit fishy, okay? So in general, this is a really complicated system of equations because here everyone is with everyone else coupled, right? So when you want to solve this, for example, for P sub K, you have to take care, okay, this Pi sub K might disappear against that one, but then there's a Pi sub K down here, right? And that makes it very complicated. Or let's say you want to solve it from U sub K, it's quite difficult because um, it appears up here in the equation, but also down here in the equation and back here. So it's really hard to find out a good update rule for that one. And it's, by the way, also these updates, they will fail, right? This is gradient descent, what we are doing. And if it's a super nonlinear function that we are trying to optimize as this one is, then we might not even be super successful. Okay, we are kind of successful with the heuristic trick, yeah? But of course, it's a difficult problem. So more precisely, actually, what we should do, and that's also what you do on the exercise sheet, we are not directly now taking derivatives of the log likelihood, but we have an additional constraint that the pi sub k should sum up to one. And as you know, we can use this Lagrange multiplier method, put this constraint back there. And then actually we are calculating the derivatives of the Lagrangian. And I think that's part of the exercises, okay? And um, then we have this minus lambda in here and we can solve these, okay? If we assume that the first term here is constant. So this is a more precise way of writing things up. Anyway, um, can we find another way 
to kind of rigorously describe the updates that we found, okay, we will end up with exactly the same updates, but we want to derive them in a different way than to take the derivatives of the Lagrangian and then solving it for pi sub k or mu sub k in a kind of fishy way. So we want to have a more rigorous way. And the idea is we can optimize it, but for this we need to add more variables, okay? In a way, that is an old idea, right? We did this for Lagrange multipliers. For Lagrange multipliers, we were also adding more variables, but here we will use it in a different way. So first of all, let's use a mixture of Gaussian as a latent variable model. And now this is again, all the stuff that you've seen before, but now written up in a slightly different manner. So the difference here is now we are introducing this latent variable Z explicitly, and we are saying, okay, there's a probability distribution for the Z, being equal to an integer value, it's pi sub k, so it's one of the parameters in theta. And then we have this conditional distribution. And we've seen that already previously in the lecture. We were always using this notation. So it's just that we again say the same thing, yeah, but like the emphasis is slightly different. So again, this choice lets us rewrite the mixture of Gaussian basically by introducing this latent variable with some, some rule here and then rewriting it with the prior of z being equal to k times like x given z being equal to k. Everything is the same as before. And however, now we view it in the following, we are not only trying to solve this for theta, but we also simultaneously want to optimize it in the z variables, okay? So we now have additional variables and we want to look at the optimization problem of optimizing both simultaneously, okay? However, I haven't told you what to maximize. So what things should be maximized. So before we were maximizing the log likelihood, however, the log likelihood didn't include the new variable z. So somehow we need to write down a complete data log likelihood that also includes these new, new variables, okay? Um, but first let's, let's look at the simple questions. So now introducing um, these latent variables, can we now do it? No, not immediately, right? Since we don't have values for those, they are unknown still, so it doesn't solve the problem right away. However, it gets easier. However, for this, we need to write down a likelihood for all the unknowns that we now have. So here comes the complete data log likelihood. First of all, what is the complete data? The complete data is now the data set D with a sub C for complete, and they are now pairs. So for every data point, I have the Xi, and I have the Zi, okay? and I only theoretically have it, right? But I want to talk about it. I want to write down a likelihood of the whole thing. And then I'm, I'm using the probability of D of my data set that is now complete, yeah, given my parameters. And that is basically just this joint distribution of X and Z. And I'm using here um, this curly L, yeah? The curly L is often used for the log likelihood of something, right? Why is it used? Because like this is looking like a function of d and theta, but typically when we talk about the likelihood, the data is assumed to be fixed, so it's constant, and we view this as a function of theta. And often we use a capital L if we talk about the probability, and if we take the log probability, we use a small l, okay? That is just a notation that you might see very often. So sometimes you see like a little l of theta, and then you might know already, oh, that must be a log likelihood, somehow of a parameter set. Okay, if we plug everything in here and use some fancy notation, so let's plug in here our expression from the previous slide. So the joint distribution has a nice simple form. It's a logarithm of pi times this one. And notice that for the complete data, here's no summation, right? So the density of my X had this summation in there and it had exactly this summation from K equals one to K in here. How However, the joint distribution where I'm multiplying basically the probability of zi and the probability of x given zi does not have a summation. So I can just plug in this pi sub zi, which is the probability of zi and the conditional distribution of x given z, okay? Now the usual trick is um, to rewrite it like in a nice way so that we can usefully transform it and do stuff with it. So how do we do this? So let's write now this thing as a product for all different clusters, okay? Here I'm just introducing 
the product of all possible values k. Yeah, so I replace the zi here with a k and then added an exponent with Iverson brackets, where I'm saying, okay, take this to the power of one for the correct zi, okay, or to the power of zero for the wrong runs, okay? So I've just rewritten this, this thing with one factor and I've rewritten it with a product of several factors where I'm selecting only one of them with the Iverson brackets. So just a reminder, I like the Iverson brackets a lot. So I didn't invent them. I, I guess Iverson invented them. I got it from Donald Knuth. Yeah, so he, he wrote lots of really nice books about computer science and he uses this notation very often in these discrete mathematics calculations. And so this is just a definition again, if you haven't seen it, but I think you've seen it already several times. So the F, so the input to the Iverson bracket is something that evaluates to true or false, okay? And then if it's true, you get a one, otherwise you get a zero. So it's so simple, okay? So I can plug in a statement that is true or false and then I get a one or zero. It's the same as the delta, the, the chronicle delta or the indicator function, all these things. However, the notation is much nicer, okay? So I can just use it as the exponent. Now the logarithm exchanges with the product, right? That's what logarithm is made for. So I get a summation over all possibilities. And then I can drag out the exponent out of the logarithm, right? Logarithm of A to B is the same as B times the logarithm of A, okay? And then I can drag the logarithm on each of these terms. And this is a nice form that we can, that is useful for us in the following, okay? So what is it, by the way? Let's look back. This is the complete data log likelihood. And of course now if we have X and Z and we want to optimize over Z and the parameter theta, now we could say, let's try to maximize the complete data log likelihood, right? So that would be something useful. And we maximize it in theta and in Z. And is it like a trick and everything is simple now? No, unfortunately not. However, it makes it somehow more rigorous to write down this thing and then to think about, so how can I optimize it in these variables? How can I optimize it in my Z variables, okay? And then we could say, okay, it's still a nasty nonlinear problem yeah, that cannot be solved with a closed form solution, but we can have alternating updates. In one step, we are updating the Z. In another step, we are updating the other variables. And you can expect already what these steps are called. They are called E-step and M-step. Or probably I mix it up, maybe M-step and E-step. I always forget which is which. But it's on the slide, so we will. I will teach you the right thing. So again, K-means is a special case for Gaussians, of Gaussians, right, of a mixture of Gaussians, where we say all proportions are the same and uh, microvariance matrix is the identity matrix. And then actually, um, if I set the derivative now of my complete data log likelihood, yeah, to zero, uh, so with respect to the means to zero, I will obtain this formula now. And this is kind of funny. So where did this nasty term in the front, why did it disappear? And the trick here is, that basically um, here everything is easier. If I take the derivative of this complete data log likelihood with respect to the mean, the derivative drags into the first summation, the derivative drags into the second summation, then there's a constant where I can drag in the derivative, then I have the derivative of a sum, and the derivative of a sum where the first term is constant with respect to the mean is only the derivative of the second summand, and then the second summand is just a logarithm of a Gaussian distribution, which is just the least square. And so everything turns out to be nice. So now how did this happen? Why now everything is so simple? It's now simple because we introduced this additional data here. And then it allows us to write this kind of responsibility terms that were called tau now in a nicer way, in a simpler way, okay? So basically now, using these complete data log likelihood, we get already this update here as the M step for the k-means, okay? Where we assume that the cluster assignments Z are constant. And then in the E step, we would say, okay, now let's redo the cluster assignments. And we do it in such a way to maximize the complete data log likelihood, okay? So this could be seen as a special case of this complete data log likelihood maximization, right? where now this is exactly the recipe to choose the optimal ZI that will maximize our complete data log likelihood. And again here, 
you can also figure that one out. So why set the optimal choice to pick the one that is closest by? Again, let's look at the data log likelihood. Basically, by choosing now a new ZI for my first data point for Z1, for, uh, for X1, for example, I can try out K equals one to capital K. I can try out all of them and I can check which of the terms in the bag kind of is the, the largest one. And the largest one is the one where my mean is closest to the XI, okay? So the first thing is constant. And this thing here kind of is influenced now, or it's not constant, but this of course is influenced by the pi, but for the k-means algorithm, I'm assuming they are the same anyway. So the first term is ir irrelevant for k-means. And I can now just find basically the little k such that the xi is closest to the mu sub k, okay? And that's the optimal choice for choosing the zi. So a bit hand wavy fiddling around with the formula, we can see that for these assumptions up here, we can now derive the M step and the E step as a maximization of the complete data log likelihood, okay? However, of course, this is not a closed form solution or anything. This is an iterative method where I'm doing alternating updates, but that's often the case in optimization. If your objective kind of is multiplying variables with each other, so you're getting a nonlinear problem, then typically you have to do alternating update, update one and then update the other one, update the first one and the second one and so on and so forth. And this is an instance of that. Let's get back to the complete data log likelihood. Okay, that's again, just writing it down. Of course, we don't have the complete data. Um, so we have a missing data problem, but we've seen already a solution on the previous slide, right? So by alternatingly given like values for the variable Z, we can estimate our parameters. And then given the parameters, we can update basically the missing data, yeah? Um, so we can do it more rigorously, more general. So let's say um, we have the incomplete data X, I and our model parameters then we could derive the posterior distribution of our unknown latent variables. Okay, so this is now getting again more probabilistic. And let me show you what I mean by this. Again, we get these responsibilities here. And they are exactly the same formulas as before, but now we are kind of saying, um, oh yeah, that's how, how we define them kind of. So these responsibilities tau sub ik was like the probability that you are in a certain class given that you are at a certain location. And now again, uh, this is just repeating the stuff that we've seen previously. So the pi is like a prior, the tau is like a posterior. Great. However, we could also talk about it that we say um, we have these expect uh, we have these distributions given a data point of our unknown missing data. So why not replace the zi with their expected values under this distribution? Okay. And as we will see. That is exactly the essence of the E step, E like expectation. So we replace the variable Z with the expectation under the stuff that we know, okay? So another way to write this, this tau I is to say, okay, we take the expectation of this Iverson bracket expression. So what is the expected value of this one? That is either zero or one. However, when you take an expectation, it will be a number between zero and one. Okay, it can come from the whole interval, right? And for this basically now to calculate an expectation, we need to assume an, a probability distribution for the ZI. And the one that we are assuming is exactly this posterior distribution. So the trick here is to say, okay, we know the data. We don't know the ZI. And let's assume we know parameters let's say they are fixed. Now, what would be, what's everything we know about the ZI? And that's expressed by this distribution. Let's use this distribution to calculate the expected value of these expressions. Um, so now when we have this expectation, yeah, we can plug it into the complete data log likelihood. So this is now the complete data log likelihood. Um, am I using the same notation as before? Ah, okay. So. I rewrote it a little bit. So that was the complete data log likelihood. And now I'm saying, let's take the expectation of the complete data log likelihood with respect to our posterior distributions for the Z. And then we will see, we can drag it into this expression. And for that one, we did a calculation. So basically now I'm introducing here a new function called Q of theta comma theta zero, but let's 
ignore that for a while and let's first look at the expression. So this is the complete data log likelihood as before. And now I wrote you down the expected complete data log likelihood. Okay, and again, these kind of complicated super long words, you just need to pass them one by one. So likelihood is a function of the parameters. The logarithm of it, okay? And then the one where we plugged in the data, so the data log likelihood. But now we're talking about the complete data log likelihood since we had these additional latent variables and let's assume they are known. And now the expectation of this expression where we replace the unknowns with their expectations. So we are calculating the expectation of this expression where we can now drag in the expectation into the summations. And since this is an expectation over the variable z, yeah, I can just use the, the, the last term here is just a constant. So I can also drag it out of the expectation and I'm getting exactly the expectation of the Iverson brackets. Okay, the expectation of the Iverson brackets, we kind of seen that this are exactly the tau sub i sub k, okay? And this is all redundant how I'm writing it up here, right? I defined the tau sub i k elsewhere and so on and so forth, but they are just the same expressions as the stuff that we did before. So what I'm doing here is basically the same stuff as last time, but giving now different justifications for the different steps. Okay, so let's plug it in. And then we get this expression that the expected complete data log likelihood is now this expression. And this was the expression where we took the derivative of, where we said, okay, let's assume the tau i sub k are constant, right? So there's a bit of cheating and let's solve it from u sub k and to get updates. Now we gave this expression a name and the name of this guy is that this is the expected complete data log likelihood. And it's like a formally totally fine thing to talk about this, okay? So you can define it, we know what it is. And we know especially also what it means to, to optimize over. Okay, now this expression gets a name and it's called Q of theta comma theta zero. So let's see what this theta and theta zero really means. So up here I said, my distribution, my current parameter estimate is theta sub zero, okay? And that was not by chance that I wrote theta zero. That is exactly the same theta zero as down here. So the theta zero is parameterizing my posterior distribution. So it's parameterizing the result that I get from taking expectation of my Iverson bracket. So it's parameterizing the responsibilities. So the responsibilities, they do depend on my current parameter theta zero, okay? However, by choosing this expectation and plugging it in my equation, now I'm saying they are constant, right? But so the theta zero here is the one that is influencing the tau sub i k. What about the theta? The theta are all the other parameters over here and they are now kind of separate. So now I'm having an optimization problem of a function that has like two inputs. And again, you can expect it already, updating the theta is the maximization step, the m step, updating the theta zero is the e step, okay? Good, here again, it's just spelled out for you. So this term depends on theta zero and this term depends on theta, okay? And again, because it's so important, I just wrote it down below, okay? So that you know, so where is this theta zero? So where does it hide? It hides in the tau i of k. Good, now let's see the, the m step for the mixture of Gaussians, okay? So for the m step, what I'm doing is, I, I say my theta zero is fixed what does it mean if the theta zero is fixed? It means that the responsibilities are fixed. And that was exactly our strategy, how we did our kind of chi derivation. So if I assume a fixed theta zero and I maximize now this Q function in theta, then my updates have this really nice form. And those are the ones that we just derived last time or that you derive on the exercises maybe as well, okay? And those can be derived if tau does not depend on pi and tau does not depend on mu and tau does not depend on sigma, okay? So, however, now this Q thing has a really nice name and we can now say, what is the M-step doing? The M-step is maximizing the expected complete log likelihood with respect to the parameter theta. Okay, this is now a more rigorous description of what the M-step is really doing, okay? So let's do the same for the E-step. So for the e-step, we assume that the thetas are constant and now we are updating the responsibility. And basically, how did we do this? 
let's see what we did. We said we take the expectation with respect to our current parameter set. Okay, so in words, we are calculating now the expected complete log likelihood by recomputing the responsibilities. So just by plugging in the current parameters, kind of, we are getting new responsibilities and these responsibilities, they basically describe our current belief about the Z. So the curious thing here is the complete data might be X and Z, but we never explicitly calculate a concrete Z. Instead, we are keeping a distribution over the unknowns Z, okay? So the tau sub IK is a, it's a probability between zero and one, okay? And it's telling us something um, about the distribution of my variable Z. I'm not fixing it. This is different to k-means. In k-means I'm saying, so please assign yourself to one of the clusters and then you won't influence anyone else anymore. So there we do the hard assignments. Here by keeping probabilities, we are getting soft assignments. Good, so the E step here is only updating the theta zero indirectly in a way, right? I mean, indirectly by just choosing theta zero being equal to theta and then recomputing the responsibilities. That's basically how we do it. So we're updating the theta zero by setting it to theta in a way. The M step updates the theta as before and the M step can be derived from the derivatives, right? Of the complete data log likelihood. And now it can be derived because the responsibilities are held constant. So now we, of course, again, must think about the question, does the E step really maximize this Q thing? Um, and for this, we stop here with the derivation and we say, let's look at it even more general, okay? So let's have a more general point of view such that everything we talked about so far becomes a special case. So here comes an even more general point of view. And I think this material I got from Michael Jordan's draft book right, on expectation maximization. So that's where I found this material. And I find it really nice because, um, you know, with EM, you have these different levels of understanding. So let's say you have an interview question, right, and a person asks you about the EM algorithm. Let's say you are interviewing for some startup or some um, already some unicorn, right, whatever. And then they are asking you, so do you know the EM algorithm? And then you say, yes, of course, k-means, and you can do this and this and this. You could surprise your, your interviewee yeah, by, by telling her, um, yeah, let me start from a very general point of view, okay? I'm following Mike Jordan's notes and there we are very general, blah, blah, blah. And everything that you know about EM algorithm is a special case of this, right? I think that would be really cool. Maybe not a good idea. Maybe you should first explain the k-means algorithm and then get more general, but it's good kind of to have a bird's eye view on this, okay? So I hope now you really want to know it, even if you're not a math person. So here's the super general setting for the EM algorithm. So we're only considering a single data point because otherwise the notation gets kind of not so easy. So let's assume we have a single data point and for the single data point, we have a single latent variable, okay? And that one we don't observe, okay? However, we write down a joint probabilistic model for my observable, my latent variable, right? That's exactly how we did it, right? We said, the joint probabilistic model for the Gaussian mixture model was that we have like a probability pi for my latent variable Z to be in one of the classes. And I have um, an observation given my latent variable, which is like a simple distribution, like a Gaussian. However, this is more general. Here the Z could be also a continuous variable that we don't observe. So in principle, I think you could also rephrase PCA, I guess, by this, I guess. So maybe I'm wrong, but I think you can also rephrase it like this. Okay. Let's write down the stuff that we just learned. So first of all, there's the normal log likelihood, right? Or let's call it incomplete data, lo data log likelihood because we model only the data X that we can observe. So it's incomplete in a way, as we know already. So which is also this curly L, right? You know it already, the L is for likelihood and this small letter L is for logarithm of the likelihood. So it's a logarithm of this likelihood and we use a mixture model here, of course, you can put an integration here, right? If that is a continuous variable. The whole derivation or the whole stuff that we are talking about also holds for integrals. And now we can extend this expression, yeah, by just extending it with Q of Z. Why not? I mean, this is introducing just a one, right? So we multiply it with one. So this is like a, a trivial step. Of course we can do it. And now we are playing around with this expression and 
Now, if we could drag in the logarithm into here, then some of you might recognize already that this is now something to do with information theory, with kullberg leibler divergence and with entropy. And actually that's where we are getting to. So in the following, we will try to get an, get an explanation or an, uh, a description of the EM procedure using notions like KL divergence and entropy, okay? Why is that important? Because this is the usual stuff that you read when you talk about the variational autoencoder, right? There's the elbow, there's some weird inequalities, and that is exactly this stuff that we are seeing today, okay? So that is exactly using the same tricks. Good, so now what about this Q? So what is it? So Q is any distribution over that, where we assume that the Q of Z is never zero, right? Because we want to divide by it, okay? So it's never zero. So it's a non-zero distribution of Z, but you can plug in any of those. Good, so far so good. Um, let's derive a lower bound for the incomplete data log likelihood, okay? And now you say, oh, again, something completely new, no, it's actually not something completely new. At the end, this lower bound, that is exactly our Q of theta comma theta zero. That is a lower bound. However, here we more generally derive it. And that is the elbow, basically. So how do we do this? So I extend it by writing here a one in here. And now I'm dragging in the logarithm, okay? And dragging in the logarithm into a summation, even into a weighted summation, is called Jensen's inequality. Right? The logarithm is not a linear function, so this is not, not equal, but the logarithm is a concave function. And for a concave function, we get an inequality. Let me just explain Jensen's inequality. Okay, so here's Jensen's inequality. Suppose f is a convex function. Let me draw it on the board, and then you immediately see Jensen's inequality. We've seen it already. A convex function is, a function is convex if the area above it is convex, is a convex set, okay? So this thing here is a convex set. Convex means if I take two points in here and I connect them, all points are also in the set, right? So if there's a function such that the um, area above it is convex, then the function is also convex. Or with other words, you can also take two uh, locations here, let's say x1 and x2, and you look at the function values, and then the connection here is all above the function value. So that means basically if I have a point in between, let's say the point a half x1 plus a half x2, then its function value, which is over there, so that is f of one half x1 plus one half x2, will be smaller or equal than the function values uh, at x1. So then 1 half f of x1 plus 1 half f of x2. As I said, if we would have linearity, we have equality, and like convexity is like one step away from linearity. So here's a small gap, okay? So that's another definition for it. However, when you view this, this is already an instance of Jensen's inequality, right? You have f of some weighted summation, okay, uh, f of some weighted summation, and you say that is less than or equal to the summation times the weight of f of xi, okay? So that is exactly Jensen's inequality. So Jensen's inequality follows immediately from this definition of convex functions. So there's nothing special about it. So here I just wrote it up for you with text. So it's just the same stuff that I just showed you. And of course, this is for two summons where basically the weights sum up to one, but you can have several weights summing up to one, okay? If they're all positive, we also have basically f of a summation of a weighted summation is equal to the weighted summation of the results, okay? Good. Now, these theta i, if they are all positive and if they are all summing up to one, they are probabilities, right? I mean, so this ex exactly applies if the theta i's are probabilities. So we can also view it more general. Suppose you have a density function, yeah? It also integrates to one, and then f of an integration is then less than or equal to the integration of this f. And so this is Jensen's inequality for integrals. It's the same stuff. It's just replacing this the single summation by a summation sign by an integration sign, okay, that's it. And 
you can also write it as expectation. So that's maybe some notation that you've seen. But that is the one that is maybe hard to understand. So easier to understand is this is up here. And then the rest follows, kind of. It must be like that. Otherwise, it kind of doesn't make sense. Okay, Jensen's inequality. Now you're all happy with it. Let's see. I dragged in the logarithm right in front of the quotient, right? So I also dragged it not only beyond the summation, but also beyond my weight. And my weight Q of Z is the density, so I'm allowed to do this. So this last expression now gets a name, and that is now a lower bound of the incomplete log likelihood. Great. So how does such a lower bound help us? So what can we do with it? Okay, so why is it useful? The nice thing is, instead of maximizing this super complicated guy here, which is like the logarithm of a summation or the logarithm of an integration of something, instead we are maximizing a simple function, which we can then easily simplify in beta. And if this is always a lower bound, it means by maximizing the lower bound, ideally we are also maximizing this guy. However, maybe we are hitting a wall at some point and we can maximize the lower bound and then that's it and we are not going further. So there might be local optima to this. So there might be a, an L of theta which is super large and with this method we will have only a local optima. This is exactly what we are experienced with k-means, right? When we are in k-means and we have a random restart, possibly we don't get the optimal solution but suddenly one cluster is cut into half and something is kind of weird and there would be a better solution but we are stuck. And that's basically in here. So I showed you already what Jensen's inequality is. Um, ah, additional information about Jensen, of course, if f is convex, minus f is concave, and you get the equality the other way around. Okay, so that's it, right? Convexity is minus concavity, and then this is kind of the trivial, right? It's just the other way around. Yeah, okay. Can you draw a function that is neither convex or concave? Any suggestions, any quick suggestions? What would be a nice one? So you can take sine and cosine or tangent superbolicus or whatever. They are all not. So somehow if they are kind of changing their shape from one to the other, then you're already done. So if they have a, 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 a um, turning point or what they call in English, Wendepunkt in German, okay? Let's look again at our lower bound and let's get a deep insight now into our M step. So let's use this lower bound, right? Before we had already a fancy description of the M step of being something fancy about the complete data log likelihood, let's get an even more fancy statement, which is even more powerful. So how does the lower bound tell us something about the M step? So for this, let's rewrite our lower bound. So we know that this, um, that the, the curly L of theta, so this log likelihood, is uh, bounded by our new expression. Let's call it capital L. And let's write it out, so by this expression. Now let's rewrite it by um, applying the logarithm to the quotient to get two summons, okay? And since the Q of Z is below the bar, you get a minus sign over here, okay? And then we get this expression. And let's look at the expressions that we get. So the first expression, can be seen like an expectation, right? I mean, it's a summation that is weighted by a density function. So it's like saying, I'm having the logarithm of this P of X comma Z, and I'm taking the expectation where the variable Z is done with respect to my distribution Q. Okay, so if you write out the expectation of the complete data log likelihood, you get exactly this expression. Okay, so that is exactly the same. Now, what about the last term? The last term has a name and it's called the entropy of a density. So the minus sign turns into a plus sign because the definition of the entropy has a minus sign, okay? So the entropy is something quite curious. It's measuring the randomness of a distribution, okay? So the randomness, how random is it? How surprising are values from it, okay? Before I explain you a bit more about the entropy, what we can conclude here is that the expected log data likelihood, yeah, which is this one, um, is a lower bound of the incomplete data log likelihood. Oh, sorry, the expected complete data log likelihood, that is this expression over here, is a lower bound to my data log likelihood because this entropy term here, um, ha, is it always positive? Okay, I'm not super sure about that one. Okay, that's kind of 
strange. Um, so maybe the first statement is a bit wrong. So I'm not sure. So let's put the first statement in its bracket. I need to do more thinking here. Maybe at some point I thought it's true. However, the entropy could be negative, right? And so if it's negative, then uh, this guy is not always a lower bound, right? So it could be, a, could be larger than that one. And then you subtract something negative and everything is fine. Uh, you add something negative and everything is fine. Okay, the first statement, let's put it into, into big brackets and put a big question mark behind it. But now let's describe the M step. So the M step, what it's doing is it maximizes the lower bound for a fixed Q. Yeah, so it's maximizing it in theta. And how does it do it? It does it by maximizing the expected complete data log likelihood, which is this expression. So the theta does not appear in the entropy term here, but the theta only appears in the first term. And that is the expected complete data log likelihood. And now flipping back through the slides to some earlier moment, yeah, maybe I should do this. So where did we see this expected log likelihood? That was exactly what we are doing over here. So the M step is maximizing the expected complete log likelihood with respect to the parameters. So that's the same thing, but now we derived it like for my, from a much more um, general point of view. Okay, so this holds for much more general um, latent variables than the stuff that we talked about before. Okay, so this is now the deep insight, the one, the second point down here, that is the deep insight, that the M step is maximizing this um, expected complete data log likelihood. Um, here's a note on the entropy. So this is how the entropy is defined. Yeah, so this term is called the entropy. It measures the randomness of a random variable. And that is like the super essential insight that Claude Shannon had when he was coming up with information theory to have a mathematical theory for like channel communication, stuff that you are doing all the time with your cell phone, actually that we are doing right now with my Wi-Fi and with the connection maybe to you. Good, here are some more insights. So the logarithms might come surprising. So why take logarithms of probabilities, right? So where does this formula come from? A few insights that might give you some hints also where to look further. So why taking logs of probabilities? So suppose you have a single fair coin and suppose you throw it and I tell you the result. Then you receive one bit of information, right? Either true or false or one or zero or heads or tail. And curiously, taking the logarithm with base two of 0.5, the probability that a fair coin shows heads and minus sign in front of it, that is exactly equal to one, okay? So now the entropy is now the expected amount of information in a random experiment. So if I take the expectation of this minus log probability, that is exactly our formula over here, okay? Of course, it is not a rigorous derivation, but it just should show you kind of where it comes from. Curiously, if I'm measuring this in bits, right, then it tells me that probabilities are like something to e to the bits. Yeah, some, and that's why I said that probabilities should be measured in decibel bits. I said that at the beginning of the lecture at some point. This is basically the reason kind of, right? Um, what I'm measuring here is now an a weighted average over it. And of course you could ask for the units, whether this is really true, what I just said. Um, if I, my entropy is measured in bits, yeah, so the minus log P of X is measured in bits. Now, what is the P of X also as a unit? However, this average here kind of should cancel out the unit of the probabilities, right? It's just a weighted average of some other quantities. So in a way, assume that there's, if the P of X has a certain unit, then there's a divided by one of the same unit, right? Like the normalizing factor which for probabilities, of course, is one. However, don't worry too much about the last two minutes, right? So this is just, should give you something. There is the entropy thing, it's quite interesting, and it kind of makes sense to take logarithm of probabilities. Another reason is, suppose you have two random experiments, like two coins, yeah, then the joint distribution is the product of those two, okay? However, entropy should measure randomness, and the randomness should be summable in a way. So we want to have a formula like this. The entropy of a pair of random variables should be the sum of the random variables, okay? And as it turns out, applying logarithm here in the formula will give us a plus sign, okay? So that's how we get the plus sign because this product here gets turned into a plus sign with the logarithm, 
Okay, so our initial choice using probabilities and multiplying them in base rule and using numbers from zero to one. So this choice now leads here to logarithms. Okay, so that's where the logarithms come from. Anyway, so that is the deep step, the deep insight into the M step is that you can kind of get this expression where you have the entropy and where you have this complete data log likelihood and expectation of it. Um, however, the entropy term here is only used for us right now, yeah, in such a way that we say it's constant with respect to the theta. And so it makes sense if you want to maximize the lower bound that you maximize this guy over here. Yeah? And then you should maximize the lower bound. Again, the first statement, I should rethink it. So that might be wrong. Good, so far so good. I mean, okay, I can tell you more about it. So the first statement is true for discrete random variables, but it might be wrong for continuous random variables. Discrete random variables always have a positive, greater and non-negative entropy, but differential entropy for continuous variables is a different story. Anyway, okay, so far so good. Let's get a deep insight also in the other one, into the E step, okay? So for this, we do basically the same thing. Again, we start with our, um, our nice lower bound, L of theta comma Q. We plug it in, the definition that we have, and now we do some tricky derivation to get another way of writing the same thing. So let's see what we are doing. So first of all, here we are using the product rule for the joint distribution. But now we are saying P of X given theta and P of Z given X. Typically we did it the other way around, right? We said that there's a P of Z, which is pi, and then there's a P of X given Z, which was a normal distribution. Let's do it the other way around. Then we get here the um, posterior distribution that we also seen before, okay? Now, Again, let's apply the logarithm to this product quotient mixture thing. And let's take these two terms, the P of Z and the Q of Z and put them into the first logarithm. And let's apply the logarithm on the other side. And since this is a product between this third term with the rest here, we get a plus sign, okay? And both are now weighted with the Q of Z. So we get these two expression. Let's first look at the last expression. So the last expression is curious. So the Z is appearing only in the Q and there's no Z in the P of X. So I can drag out the logarithm of P of X. I can drag it out of the summation, okay? And then I say I'm summing out all possibilities. So the summation of Q of Z is equal to one. So it just disappears, okay? So this, is, this expression here is just the logarithm of P of X given theta. Oh. And this is our log likelihood, great. So we can plug in our curly L without the C, okay? So that is the log likelihood. That is interesting because now we have this log likelihood on both sides of the inequality here, okay? So we have the L over here and we have the L over there. So that makes this term here really interesting because that is exactly describing the gap between the two, right? So the the difference between my lower bound and the log likelihood here is exactly described by this term where I haven't told you what it is. So let's look at the term and we basically get this expression where we have a weighted summation with Q of Z of some distribution of Z and some other distribution of Z, okay? And this is actually the so-called KL divergence. So that is an, an, a formula that allows us to calculate the distances between two distributions, okay? So this is minus the KL divergence between the distribution Q of Z, which is the distribution for my random variable Z, and the distribution P of Z given an X and theta. So this is another distribution for my Z. And basically the difference between those two, or I could also say the mismatch between those two distributions, Z is exactly measuring the gap, right, between the lower bound and the log likelihood that I have. So rewriting this, I could also move the L of theta comma Q to the other side. Yeah, then I have L minus this bound. And as it turns out, this then will be exactly this minus KL thingy over here, okay? So this looks a bit weird, right? Because there's the L greater or equal and then there's the minus KL. So where does the minus go? So let me put it on the board. It's simpler, simpler than you think. Or maybe for you it's obvious, but let me just write it out. 
So here now I'm looking at L of theta minus the L of theta comma Q. And now what I'm doing is I'm plugging in the expression for the L of theta comma Q. And the expression is, it is um, minus the KL of something plus L of theta. Okay, so that is the minus sign from here. That is the minus sign from the, um, from the slide. And then basically it means, okay, so minus and minus is plus. So I get the KL of something. And this minus and plus is minus, so the likelihood disappears. So this thing here is really the distance. And one can show that the KL diversion is always positive. So that basically fits our inequality, right? So this thing is greater than that thing. That's expressed by the fact that the KL diversion is greater or equal to zero. I mean, that's also how we derived it, right? We derived it as a lower bound, but also from the fact that this thing is positive, we get the equation again. Anyway, in particular, it tells us the gap between the lower bound and the thing we're interested in is measured by the KL diversions. Okay, good. Again, I have a couple of slides on the KL diversions. In general, it's defined like that. So you have two, dis uh, two um, probability distributions for some random variable Z. And then the KL diversions is defined like the weighted average of the logarithm of the quotient. Okay, that's just how it is. If you flip the roles of P and Q in the quotient, you need to have a minus sign over here. You always need to be sure which is which, okay? There are a couple of facts, so it's greater or equal to zero. There's a short proof, right? And the short proof is based on that the logarithm of, um, so if you want to prove it yourself and you want to try it, then use the fact that the logarithm of A is uh, greater or equal to A minus one. Okay, so that is like a fact. If you, if you look at the logarithm, like there's another line and it's, it's, a, it's a bound above the logarithm. And using that fact, you can show that the KL diversion is always positive. However, why is it called diversions? Because it's not a distance. So it's not a distance in the sense that it's symmetric. So it's measuring something like distances, but measuring the distance from here to there is different than from there to here. That's why they only call it a diversions. Actually, it is in differential geometry terms where I'm not at all familiar with. I can just have here party knowledge. So it's an alpha divergence. Who? So I don't know what an alpha divergence is, but the KL diversion, as, I, as far as I know, is an instance of it. Yeah. Um, curiously, so what does it mean now to have it one or the other way around? So somehow the, the term that is in the front here is telling us how to weight, right? So how to say how important are the different areas that I'm having? So kind of where the Q is large, that's where I will compare Q and P if I put the Q at the first position. If I do it the other way around, then I'm comparing them where the P is large, okay? So uh, here's an example why that might be something relevant and that make a difference. So suppose that's one distribution, okay? Let's say that is P of Z and um, oh, let's draw it like this. Um, that is Q of Z, okay? Then the, the P of Z will say, oh, we are really different, okay? So the um, KL divergence, what notation did I use? Oh, I just used KL of P and the Q, yeah? That is really large, okay? So we are really very different, okay? Because I'm having all my weight over here and where I'm having most of my weight, you are zero, okay? So we, we are really very different. However, if you take the other one, the KL diversions of Q, from the perspective of Q, then Q says, yes, where I am, you also have a bump. So we are kind of similar, right? We are not the same, right? There's some gap here, but you also have some weight. So I would expect that we get something like this in this, in this picture here, okay? Of course, now, <coughs> which should you use, one or the other? It depends on your method. So when you look at variational autoencoders or these kind of things, that's always is playing around that you get an expression 
So I said this thing could be either you can get a closed form solution because for Gaussians you can get a closed form solution or for some other nice distributions or that the expectation that is involved here, an expectation over the P, that's where the data is. So that's where you have data. So you can ex calculate, replace this by an expectation with some data, okay? So that's whether you choose one or the other. There are many methods in, um, in also in Bayesian approximation theory that uses this KL stuff. And then there's often a version where you use it one way. And then there's a trick that you can also use it the other way. And that's like a different way to approximate things. Ah, then there's another thing. I mean, why put these bars in here? Yeah, that's, I don't know, whatever. This is like some convention, which I don't know why. So maybe that's a question for you to look up on Stack Overflow. And please tell me if you know. So comma would be perfectly fine, right? Why not putting a comma? Um, and that is another important concept in information theory. They are all related. And as you can see, it's also an expectation. It's an expectation of the quotient of two distributions, right? So in a way, the entropy can be also seen as a special case. Um, it's basically the entropy is like the KL diversions to the uniform distribution, right? So how do you compare to the uniform distribution? Because then the bottom term disappears. So they are all related and are interesting stuff. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that's what I just said, great. So um, let's again look at the lower bound, how it's related to the E step. So we've seen now that the gap between our likelihood and our lower bound is exactly the KL version of this function of this distribution Q and of this posterior, posterior distribution of the Z. So what was this posterior distribution? That's what, what our, that was our current best guess, right? For our unknown latent variables. So if we would have to guess, we should take the expectation of this distribution, okay? So what it does, tell us now. So in the E step, what should we do? Yeah, we should kind of trying to minimize this gap. So let's close the gap by getting this thing being equal to zero. So how do we get it to zero? We get it to zero now by choosing the Q of Z to be exactly this distribution, okay? So that is the, the E step. So the E step is basically choosing a particular Q of Z. Interesting, how did we introduce the Z anyway at the first place? So are we free to choose whatever we want? So let's step back. Where was it? So it was over here. And here we said, um, oh, where did we? Here we said, um, let's write it more complicated. Let's write some distribution Q of Z. So we didn't have any assumptions on the Q of Z. So the Q of Z can be anything. In particular, we can freely choose it in the E step to our liking, okay? And our liking will be to close the gap from the lower bound to the thing we want to optimize, okay? So we did the whole derivation with this kind of additional baggage of having a Q of Z, where I haven't told you what it is, but being completely free to choose it is great because then in the E step, we can now plug in the best fitting distribution, which is the, um, the posterior distribution um, for the Z given a data point. So if our current estimate of theta is theta zero, yeah, we should choose Q, I should, I should write here Q of Z being equal to this distribution. Okay, now we are almost finished. So here comes the super general form of the AM. So we have an observable variable and of course, I might have several observations, but let's say I'm only having a single random variable to have the notation nice. Then I have a single latent variable, or if I have several x, I might have several z, and that is a non-observable variable. We write down a joint probabilistic model for those. Okay, this is our model assumption, yeah. Then we randomly initialize a parameter vector theta, and now let's put the zero up there, yeah, for nicety. Then we repeat until convergence some set of alternating updates, okay? So the first update is choose a Q that maximizes our lower bound, okay? And we know what the solution is. The solution to Z1 is the posterior distribution with our current parameter set, okay? So this at first looks really difficult because an arc marks over a distribution, that's fancy, right? I mean, the Q could be, um, a cluster assignment, right? Then it's like choosing 
are we choosing this Gaussian or are we choosing that Gaussian or are we choosing another Gaussian? That's what we did in k-means. However, in general, we could say we could maximize over all possible distributions. And if we do this, we could prove that the best choice by looking at the KL diversion is exactly this distribution because this thing is closing the gap. This is optimal. This is the optimal choice for the Q. Now, given the Q, so the QT plus one, which I now plug in here for the L, yeah, I can maximize in terms of the theta. And there we've seen with the deep insight that maximizing this lower bound is exactly the same as maximizing. Now comes again for the last time today, the super long phrase, the expected complete data log likelihood. Okay. So this guy is something that we can write down once we fix our joint probabilistic model. Okay. Then we can write down the expected complete data log likelihood. Okay. And then we can take derivatives of this guy and everything will be fine because the responsibilities, they are fixed by our choice of Q. Okay. And we typically can do a good job. And this thing can be then uh, min uh, uh, maximized like in an easy way because the expressions that we get are easy to handle. So last thing for today, we can now view this procedure, which is now already the super general form of the EM as an even more um, general method, which is called auxiliary function optimization. So all of this that I just showed you is an instance of a more general form, which is called um, optimization by auxiliary variables, uh, by auxiliary functions. However, before I show you, let me just stress again. So this general form is having now all the stuff that we know about EM, K-means, Gaussian mixture fitting, and so on and so forth as a special case, okay? And these equations here, they were rigorously derived. They don't give us guarantee that the whole thing will always converge to the optimal value, but they show us that we're having updates that are not doing anything bad. So they are not like decreasing the likelihood or something. They can only increase the likelihood. However, I might get stuck into local situations. Okay, now, what is this super general thing of auxiliary functions? So those are the last two slides. So what is an auxiliary function? This is a notion for an optimization. And the idea is super general and you can apply it in many situations. So suppose you want to maximize some function. Let's call it curly L of theta, right? But this could be an F of X, or this could be whatever you like, whatever you have at hand that you want to optimize. And let's say it's super difficult to do. So instead, what you do is you introduce now an auxiliary function L of theta comma theta zero, yeah, with two inputs that has the following uh, properties. First of all, it should be easy to maximize. Yeah, so candidate for this would be, for example, um, uh, a quadratic polynomial, right? So if it's like a, it's a parabola, then there's a closed form solution and it's very easy to optimize. Then you need the property that it touches my function that I actually want to minimize. So what does touching mean? Touching mean if I have L of theta comma theta, so twice the same input, I want to have exactly the function value. Um, and it should lower bound my function, okay? So it should be always smaller for any of the theta zero. So let me draw a picture of an auxiliary function for a complicated one. And then you already see maybe that it's not so abstract as it looks like firsthand. So suppose we have a very, I don't know, some weird complicated landscape like this. Okay, so this is our L of theta. Yeah, that you want to optimize. That is the one. Now it's super complicated. Let's define an auxiliary function. Okay, that is easy to optimize. Here is one. So this parabola over here. So this is now my function L of theta comma theta zero. Okay, so now where is the theta zero? So suppose the, oh, I think this is a theta zero. So this thing is basically now a simple function. In this case, it's a, it's a quadratic function and I can in one step jump to its optimum, okay? And um, the other thing is it's touching my function and it's lower bounding it, so it's always smaller, okay? And now by, um, how can I optimize this now? Oh yeah, so, we, so maybe my picture, maybe let's make it a little bit more 
more detailed and better. So it's touching it over here, but it's going up there. So maybe something like this. Is that a good choice? I'm not sure whether I like it. Ah, kind of. So I'm jumping to this location, fine. And then I kind of need to replace getting again to the touching point and again putting a parabola that then gets, ah, ah, okay, now let's do it once precisely. Okay, let me try to draw it precisely, otherwise it's useless. So, so now how does your optimization work? So this is now my theta zero, that's where I am right now, okay? And now I'm defining an auxiliary function and the auxiliary function is a function which is touching the one that I actually want, okay? Now at theta zero. However, I can let my theta vary and I could now say, I know that for all possible values, the L of theta zero and theta, uh, theta and theta zero is always smaller than the one that I want to optimize. So from theta zero now, I'm doing an update by jumping right to the optimal value over here, okay? So that is the optimal value over there and I know the other function can be only larger than that one because this one is below the other one, okay? And now, basically now I'm saying, so this thing here, what I did is the um, E step or the M step, I always mix it up. So this is one of them, so let's call it the X step. So you need to plug in X and Y for me. And then once I did this, I'm putting now a new one that, which is touching over here. Yeah, and this replacing thing, that is the Y step. So that is the other one. So I'm alternative, so I'm trying to maximize this wiggly function, which is super complicated by putting an auxiliary function below it and optimizing that one and moving it around a little bit. Okay, maybe the mass is simpler than my explanation. So my starting point might be the, some theta zero. And as I know by the touching property, yeah, it is L of theta zero, theta zero, great. Now, oh, in the M step, it's called M step. I'm optimizing this function in the first parameter. So I can only increase it. So it's less than or equal than the one that I had before, uh, greater or equal than the one that I had before. Great. Next, what I'm doing is I, um, I know that this L function is a lower bound yeah, to my true function. So in particular now I could plug in a theta one in here and I could only increase it, right? Because this guy here is great as smaller or equal to the L of theta one. Yeah, so that is this property. So no matter what I write into the second position, the left hand side is smaller than the right hand side, which means that this guy will be smaller than that guy. However, this guy can be written, rewritten as L of theta one, theta one. And plugging in basically for the second position now the theta one, that's the E step. And then again, I'm optimizing in the first variable, that's the M step, and then plugging in the first variable into the second one, that is again the E step, and so on and so forth. And I'm generating a chain that can only increase, okay? So with other words, the EM is an instance of this method, and what we are doing is here some greedy hill climbing for a complicated function by optimizing iteratively a simpler function, okay? So that is like the super general point of view. And then one can show that this sequence of estimates can only increase, so I only can get better. However, I might end up in a local maximum, okay? So that's like the downside. It's nonlinear optimization, so there's nothing for free here. So we have a method that kind of maximizes it, but we can never be sure that it will work that it will find the optimal. It works, but it doesn't find the optimal. Okay, so let's get finished, two o'clock. So here's a summary of k-means, em, and, and so forth. So the summary is basically the general form of em. So that is basically it. So that is explaining everything, right? So if you now would have k-means algorithm, you need to think, so what does it mean to kind of choose this distribution? For k-means, it means pick one of the clusters. Okay, for the fitting of the Gaussian mixtures, it means um, calculate the responsibilities, tau sub ij or tau sub ik. And what about the M step? The M step is maximizing 
the expected complete data log likelihood. And that is a function where I can calculate derivatives and where I can kind of do gradient descent on, okay? K-means is a special case. However, typically it's motivated heuristically, but the heuristics is completely, completely perfect. So it's really doing the right thing. You can rigorously derive it from this setup. Fitting Gaussian mixture model is a special case. And again, the general form of EM is a special case of the auxiliary function trick, okay? So I'm not saying now you need to know this auxiliary function trick and all this. I just want to, that you have heard it. And then when you see somewhere is using the auxiliary function trick, then you should be aware, oh, that wasn't so difficult. There was, there were two slides and um, the professor was not able to explain them well, but it, it cannot be super difficult, right? It's EM somehow. Good. Um, by the way, in a way, this EM procedure can be in general use for the missing data problem. Yeah? Suppose you are doing linear regression from 10 dimensions to one dimensions, and sometimes in some of the dimensions, numbers are missing, right? You could view them like latent variables, and you can use exactly those two steps, right, to solve your missing data problem. So given all the parameters, so given your first estimate of your plane that you want to fit through your data, yeah, you can get an estimate of the missing data. And then using these estimates, you can update your parameters again. So this EM procedure is also like, can be applied to missing data in a data set. But this is something I haven't talked about it at all. Good, so this is the end of K-means and friends. Okay, let's see, there's a question. Can the entropy really be negative if it's the negative of a product of a PDF value between zero and one and the log of a PDF? Yes, it can, it can. Um, so how can it happen? Um, I'm not super sure. So please check out um, if you have a, a PDF. So if X is um, distributed according to some PDF, so with a continuous distribution, yeah, continuous distribution, then this H of X, yeah, sometimes it's also written as a little H and this little h then is also called differential entropy. And please look up on the web, why can the differential entropy be sometimes be negative? I'm sure then you will get an example, okay? So there are examples where it can be negative. Anything else? Any more questions? If not, then thanks a lot for your attention and we see each other again on Monday. Okay, bye-bye.